All right, by now, guys, you know, I love talking about old wrestling. What you might not know is it's not my real passion. My real passion is helping people save money. My real passion is getting families out of apartments and into houses. My real passion is getting people's finances aligned so they can retire on time. I hated going to Walmart and seeing the greeter being 80 years old. She should not be working. She should be home. Why is she still working? Because she still has a mortgage. I want to help avoid that for you. The other thing I want to help you with, let's make sure your kids don't get saddled with student loans. If you've got a student loan, why did you get one? Maybe because your parents still had a mortgage. I'm not saying that to be fun. I'm being sincere. There's only so much money to go around. What I want to help you do is figure out where you are right now and where you want to be long-term. And I do it at SaveWithConrad.com. I've been doing mortgages for more than 20 years. And during all that time, we've helped tens of thousands of families change their life. I mean, routinely, we're helping our podcast listeners save five, six, seven, eight hundred bucks a month, but more importantly, get them out of debt faster and with cheaper monthly payments. But if you don't think it can happen for you, let me just tell you this. We are not the bank. We don't say no. We say not yet, but here's how. We're going to get you a game plan on how to improve your credit, how to save a little bit of cash and how to get into that dream house. Maybe you're already in the house, but it would be nice if someday we could put a pool in the back or one day we want to upgrade to hardwood floors or remodel the kitchen or get a badass master bathroom. I can help you do all of that with no money out of pocket right now at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket. And if we can't help you save some cash, we won't waste your time. Check it out. SaveWithConrad.com, NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender. And hey, y'all, don't take my word for it. Check us out. We've got an A-plus with the Better Business Bureau. And as if that's not enough, go look at our reviews. Read them and weep, haters. ConradReviews.com. You'll see more than a thousand five-star reviews. Our average review is 4.72 stars. Find out how much money you can save. Take control of your life in 2023 by taking control of your finances. We're going to show you how to keep more of your own money. If you've got credit card debt, what are you paying on that? 14%, 28%, you know you can do better. With the mortgage though, you may not know this, the interest you pay is tax deductible. And we can even show you how to skip your next two house payments. So if you can get a lower monthly payment, pay your debt off faster, get a greater tax deduction at the end of the year. And right now, right after the holidays, skip your next two payments. Buddy, this is the biggest no brainer in the history of the world. Find out how much money you can save right now for free at savewithconrad.com. Or hey man, shoot me an email directly. Conrad at savewithconrad.com. be in a good mood anytime you hear mr in your house right i think that's the first time i've actually uh seen it and heard it on the show it looks great well we are excited that you look great we look a little different today you were not in studio you were on the road and top secret business that we can't talk about here on the show but nah. it looks like you're safe and sound i don't see you holding up a newspaper so we're probably no. <laughs> I'm doing okay. When I checked this uh, video, when I checked the lighting out, uh, I was like, all right, I like this. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, Conrad, I got a new carry-on uh, bag, and it looked great, got great reviews, but it doesn't have the room that the one I, uh, I uh, inherited from my daughter, the Star Wars bag, she lent me, and I kind of kept for eight months. So I've got to travel without my uh, my own lighting, and I'm just lucky that I'm at a hotel that's got some decent lighting, and I think I look uh, quite dapper with my new haircut. I am liking the new haircut. Uh, there's a lot new in wrestling, too. Uh, by now, we know who won the Royal Rumble. Cody Rhodes has punched his ticket. He's going to main event WrestleMania, and, of course, along the way, there were some fans who thought, oh, it should have been Sammy. And you and I haven't been shy about how much we have loved Sammy's work. It looks like Sammy's going to get Roman first at Elimination Chamber and in his hometown in Montreal. Wow. I got to think that's going to be one of the biggest pops in WWE history, no? I would think so, man. That's really good because ah, not just, oh, this is where the storytelling has storytelling's been so strong. Yes. And WWE has to be really careful uh, with what, you know, in how they treat what they have in Sami Zayn. So if it's a one-off, 
uh, I think fans would be upset and subconsciously take that out on Cody. So I think it's really important that uh, Sammy be treated uh, reverently by the people in charge because that's, uh, you know, we call him the gift that keeps on giving. We want him to just keep on giving. Yes. Uh, you don't want this title shot to be like the peak of his uh, storyline and then soon forgotten. Well, I don't think that's going to be the case, or at least I hope not. Uh, but along the way, we did get to see the type of magic that Cody can make on his own. He oh, had shared the ring with Paul Heyman this past Monday. What a segment they had. Did you see it? What'd you think? Yeah, I saw clips of it. I was on the road. I've been working really hard, uh, Conrad, putting a lot of miles in. But I saw clips, and immediately I, I could tell how much that had resonated. I mean, leave it to Pauly to come up with a lot like you are. Your father's favorite son, but Roman Reigns is a son he always wanted. That's just, I mean, it's its great mic work. And, uh, the, the you know, it's every time you uh, are engaged with Paul, it's like a master class in oration. And uh, Cody gets better with each and every week. It's uh, it's also been a fun week. We saw the the ladies close raw with a cage match, not that long ago. That didn't feel like something that could could ever really be possible. The ladies main eventing a raw and in a cage match. I think they more than held their own on Monday. And I'm so happy to see uh, Lita back in the fold. Um, yeah. For those of you who may have heard about a show we may or may not be doing together, hypothetically. <laughs> So uh, Alita and I were always good friends, but we've become really tight uh, through the course of this uh, project, and I'm really happy for her. And she's a big time player. And I, uh, my worry coming out of uh, the Rumble was wh wh where what lay in store for Becky Lynch, but it seems like the man is going to be uh, you know taken care of come Mania time. Well, we're looking forward to uh, taking care of a great story from 25 years ago. We're coming off a of Three Faces of Foley episode, and now we're going to be talking about one of the biggest angles you were ever a part of this week. Fresno, California is the site for Monday Night Raw the day after the Royal Rumble, and I think this is uh, one of the times where the WWF is going to start gaining momentum in this Monday Night War. Mike Tyson joins Vince McMahon in the ring for the main event segment to announce that he's going to be at WrestleMania. Here comes stone cold. And along the way, what a historic show. This was you team with chainsaw, Charlie, <laughs> and you take on the Quebecers. Were you surprised to see Jacques and Pierre back in the WWF? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I was, I mean, uh, um, uh, Jacques, <laughs> Pierre was, uh, I'm not saying Jacques wasn't talented because Jacques was much better known than Pierre. Pierre had the run as uh, the pirate and he did some great stuff. Maybe not the right time for a talent like Pierre, like he probably would have been better served in the Attitude Era. And the two of them were, were a good team. Uh, and, and, you know, there it wasn't like the Rougeos because, you know, they were brothers and had, had such great history. But, yeah, they were a good team. They were a good team. And on that day, you know, uh, Terry and I were supposed to look pretty strong, you know, and that's where the uh, uh, the arbitration begins backstage. <laughs> oh, no. I you make that come about when a new team, you know, clearly wants to get their stuff in. But I think, I think it worked out okay. I'll be honest, I don't have that many mem memories of the match. I remember one specific thing is that Terry Funk was a believer in, like, the sloppy backdrop in the sense that it looked more realistic than a picture-perfect textbook backdrop with the great Harley race arch. And so if you look back, it'll look almost like a mistake, but much more in keeping with the way the back body drop would look in a uh, combat situation. And we've seen back body drops in some extent in, uh, in Hollywood and in movies. And that's the way that it's done there, where it's like the body, one body lifting another one into the air, but not necessarily in textbook perfect uh, form like Harley. We called it 
the Harley backdrop at Danucci. So that stood out to me. Uh, Terry Funk's belief that not not only should not everything look perfect, but sometimes you should go out of your way to make sure it does not look perfect. In today's world, it would be called a botch, but that yes. was what Terry did to create uh, realism. Well, there's some realism here because you bring a barbed wire baseball bat here ringside at this point, And you've told us before the original plan was we're going to try to work a death match at WrestleMania, me yeah. and, and chainsaw Charlie or Terry Funk. When you're bringing the barbed wire bat here, you're kind of thinking in the back of your mind, that's where this is going. Right. I'm hoping. Yeah. 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 I'm hoping that's where, where it's going to go. It obviously didn't go there, although it did go somewhere. Um, uh, fairly pleasant before we talk about the big moment that everybody saw on ESPN the next day, I do want to ask in regards to Shawn Michaels injury, because we yeah. all recall he took the big bump, uh, over the, uh, the ring and landed on the coffin, but he did have for lack of a better word, some people who weren't so trusting of his injury qualms over the years, going back to when he lost his smile the year before and all that jazz. Did you see any evidence of the injury? When did you first hear about it? When did you know, Hey, Sean's hurt. This is a bad deal for us. You know, I don't see what Sean would have to gain out of feigning an injury because right. he did go into mania. You know, I um, mean, he did have a heck of a match. Uh, uh, look at, you'd have to walk a mile in Sean's shoes to know what he was feeling. And he was a guy who, uh, over the course of his career, put so much into almost every match. Uh, I mean, no doubt. I mean, to me, I mean, I saw Sean when he came back and he was always, um, uh, uh favoring that back, uh, ice or heat, you know, stretching. I don't think, yeah, I think you have to give guys the benefit of the doubt, especially when there doesn't seem to be any upside to feigning an injury like that. And most of the time I've found that when you, ha well, maybe not most of the time, I guess you'd have to look at the videos and do some type of mathematical analysis. But many times um, a severe injury is really just the, uh, the straw breaking the camel's back. There that was the case, yeah. When I uh, I I went through my match with Randy Orton, I lost sixty pounds to come back um, at Mania. Team up with The Rock, came up a little short. Came back, had that hellacious match with Randy, um, and then two days later, I went to stand up when I was watching my kids play, and I couldn't stand. And so it wasn't because I was watching my children play that my uh, ligament snapped. It was just hanging on by a thread. And then that was the straw that broke the camel's back. So, you know, there's no shortage of spectacular Shawn Michaels bumps that could have been the cause of the injury. So I'm going with benefit of the doubt to the heartbreak kid, real injury. Final answer. I like it. I like it. Conrad, can I ask a question of you? Please do. Uh, what is our subject today? We're talking about the dumpster match. Oh, we are. are we really? Yeah. Okay. I thought we were talking about no way out with me in Austin. Well, don't you do some dumpster stuff on the way there? <laughs> well, no we're thinking way out 98, buddy. Yeah. This is, I thought we were talking May 98. You're telling me that we're talking <laughs> what you're telling me is that all the homework I opted not to do about May of 98. You've wasted. <laughs> You've wasted all of that time you didn't spend preparing. All right, let's just wing it then. That, that was a good time. Yeah, that was the build up to uh, Mania was like, a good time. So uh, this is what my dad would call flying by the seat of my pants. Uh, well, we're talking about 25 years ago, some February of 98. It's that no way out. Not necessarily... Your oh, May what is the what was the May PPV? Uh, wasn't, what was that, that? wasn't that Unforgiven? Over, over the edge, yeah, 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 over the edge. All right, okay, okay, no way out. Okay, you were right. I was wrong. I leapt to an assumption, and I know what happens when you assume because I've read T-shirts telling me. <laughs> well, we know what happened when Stone Cold got in the ring with Vince McMahon. You see this character get larger than life. You know, the yeah. idea that there's a photo as you're watching here on foliuspod.com 
I mean, you see Austin throwing up the double bird right there to Mike Tyson, and then you see Vince's reaction in the background. It does a lot for the Mr. McMahon character and the Steve Austin <laughs> character. You've told us before, but this was sold out at the monitor. Everybody wanted to see what Iron Mike was doing, right? And everyone wanted to see Sarge's facial expression. Uh, should put it back up there if you can for, yeah, look at that. It's like a very contemplative reaction by the, by the Sarge. Vince, Vince was tremendous. Everyone did their, you know, was, was awesome in their role. And this resulted in uh, the, t the type of widespread uh, mainstream uh, coverage that we rarely, rarely received. And it was a giant boost in the arm because uh, our show had been really exciting, but we were still trailing on the ratings of WCW. So I think everybody involved saw that as a landmark moment. That face that Sergeant Slaughter had is the face you shot me when you asked, what's our topic today? <laughs> very, very similar. Uh, listen, we know that the Mr. McMahon character and, and his feud with Stone Cold, the volume's going to get really turned up after WrestleMania, but right. man, they're starting to get into gear here. And the next night we see an episode of, uh, or a taping of Raw where you and Terry are shown setting up the ring, talking with each other, you're uh, sort of poking fun and complimenting each other regarding your gimmicks. This is like a, a peek behind the curtain, sort of quote unquote, breaking kayfabe stuff. Is this a Vince Russo idea? I think it may have been, uh, no matter whose idea it was, I thought it was a good one. Yes. I agree. A little glimpse because we are, uh, we can't take the, um, the viewer back. Uh, too far. And I don't, at that time, I don't know if we were allowed to show footage of what we'd done in Japan. I'm not sure about that, but it wasn't as, you know, you, you many viewers knew the history that I share with Terry, but um, a much larger percentage did not. So it's up to WWE to tell that story. And I think that was a pretty effective way of doing it, doing it. You're going to take on the new age outlaws in a non title match and the outlaws come out wearing baseball's catcher's gear, which works to their advantage. Uh, when you give road dog a low blow and he's wearing a cup. So a uh, pretty fun little piece of business there. Uh, it's a fun match when it's a brawl. Terry starts throwing chairs in the ring, which doesn't result in a DQ until you hit dog in the head with the chair. Okay. Put the ref in the mandible claw again and cover road dog with chairs and funk comes off the top with a moonsault onto the chairs and dog, man, this is uh middle-aged and crazy at its best here for Terry funk. Oh yeah, man. You know, I think Terry realized this was his last, uh, um, by the raw and WWE and, uh, that eventually one of these, uh, one of these retirements was going to stick. And so, uh, he really, uh, he, that's just his nature to put everything he has into everything he does. what do you think of the rhythm you were getting with the, the new age outlaws at this point? I mean, these are really two really struggling singles characters, you know, as rockabilly and the road dog, they were kind of lost. And then once they get put together as the new age outlaws, man, they started to get hot pretty quickly. Were you noticing the same thing? Oh yeah. Because I believe I was on the house show when they were first put together as a tag team and it was just like, man, something clicked. And, uh, and that can be a really magical thing to, uh, to be part of, to look on and see something working and getting over and, and uh, becoming bigger than the sum of its parts. It's not a knock on either one of the guys. It's just that when they were together, man, there was that special element. And I really looked forward to, um, to being part of it. I don't think I was in the know enough. I don't think I was given, I don't think I was given the word that these guys were going to be uh, part of the new DX. Um, even after mania, uh, I don't know if I've alluded to this before, uh, but Vince Russo was really bummed out at the post mania party. And hey, Vince, what's wrong? And he was really down. He'd received a brow beating from Shawn Michaels about how, you know, they'd really weakened uh, DX. I guess Shawn knew that uh, that uh, Road Dog and Billy were joining. 
and man within 24 hours you know they had every bit of heat back and then some you know tenfold so uh i'm not i'm not sure again if i had known that vince was upset and realized that he would have reason that uh, the, the dx would be getting their heat back then maybe i did know but it's been 25 years well on the same episode where uh you have this match with all the catcher's gear you and funk are interviewed in the back but dx distracts you two and the outlaws sneak attack and then the officials break it up um you know hunter and sean are at the top of the card here and and that's 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 a good position for you guys to be i mean especially as this new tag team outfit and you're in the main event scene scheduled to team with austin and funk to take on sean and the outlaws in philadelphia but of course Sean can't make it due to his back. You wrote in your book, don't get me wrong. The team wasn't a failure, but it did fail to live up to what I thought it could be. I thought we could usher in a new era of danger and dynamic promos into the world of sports entertainment. Instead, we were just a couple of popular wrestlers who were miles apart from Steve Austin on the food chain. Is this, uh, is that still the way you feel? With the benefit well, of uh, yeah, I, looking back, I, I can be, it seems like I can be a little tough on myself at times, but I, I think that's, uh, that's fair. Like we were, I, you know, I don't think it takes into consideration what we were able to do as far as being the people in the ring when that uh, DX, new DX invasion took place. And we were popular enough that, uh, you know, the audience really took to that turn because they were putting me and uh, Terry was injured at mania. So he was handcuffed to the, the fence and I took most of the abuse and it was quite a, quite a bit of abuse. And then it went on to really, you know, <sighs> light a fire underneath me. Uh, because when I was laying there, this is like 20 seconds after uh, the outlaws had left after laying the beating down uh i think howard finkel said make sure not to go away because coming up soon stone cold steve austin and the crowd just started you know just turned just started chanting steve's name as if we had never existed terry and i and that's the type of thing that's gonna hurt a guy's feelings and uh so i just realized that that se- at that second like i'm gonna hold on to the way i feel right now and i'm going to use it to my advantage somewhere down the line when i do make this turn I don't know if I knew uh, at that time uh, that there would be a turn, but I did feel like if there was one, I could use this. At one particular six man tag in Louisville, Kentucky, my value became clear to me. You would write the crowd was chanting the familiar Rocky sucks. Rocky sucks. When road dog got on the mic to disagree. No, he doesn't. (laughs) His timing's good. He looks great. Plus he's a pretty good guy. Great line by road dog and the match started (laughs) and Owen and I got nice responses to our respective moves. Then I tagged in Austin and the place went crazy. Do you ever get the feeling that he's the main course and we're just a couple of side dishes? Owen jokingly asked me, Austin threw some punches. The crowd went wild. Kind of like a baked potato. I said to Owen, Austin flipped off gun and the roar got even louder. Jack, let's face it. You're like a three bean salad that no one even wants. Owen Connor. <laughs> Austin hit the Luthes press, a move so silly it could practically be called the dick to the mouth. <laughs> and the Louisville Gardens erupted. Owen, let's face it, you and I are just little sprigs of parsley that will be thrown <laughs> out after dinner. <laughs> yeah, you're right, Owen agreed. That's exactly what we are. <laughs> I love your style of writing here and self-deprecation. <laughs> well, uh, hey, to quote The Rock, who was quoted by Travis Kelsey just uh, after the uh, AFC Championship, you know, you, you got to know your role and shut your mouth. And uh, so The Rock's on this like lunar <laughs> moonshot explosion. Steve is, uh, he's the most popular man in the wrestling business at that point. And uh, we were, we were just like the little side additions. Maybe not actually the Sprigs of Parsley, but maybe Owen wasn't far off when he said we're the three-bean salad. Yeah. 
I love that tickles you. Uh, I do the fact that this is a real conversation taking place in front of the sold out crowd and we can have this type of man to man conversation while Steve is setting the building on fire. It's tremendous. The next live raw we have is February 2nd from Indianapolis. And the show opens with DX pretending they're uh, doing a press conference like president Clinton. They're breaking (laughs) down all the language that they will use on different parts of the show. Of course, this is allegedly in response to USA wanting them to tone down some of the language and they're just letting it all rip. And of course we're bleeping it out. (laughs) Did you think the company was going too far or were you digging it? (sighs) No, we'll have to figure out what episode was the one where they first said, suck it. Right. Uh, I remember turning to, uh, they were getting really close to that line, and I turned to Dennis Knight, well, it's better, best known as Naked Midian, and said, I might as well just say suck it. And the next week they did, and it wasn't like, I, I don't think anyone overheard me or Dennis, or he went and said, geez, Foley's got a great idea, like that had probably, probably been the plan all along. I, you know, I'm old school, and I'm a gentleman, so I never use that phrase without a please. <laughs> Oh gosh, I love you for that. You have to start with please. It's not a demand. It is a serious question. It's a request. But anyway, anyway, nobody wants to hear me talk that way. Um, but that that was when I thought this might be getting a little a little out of hand, but the crowd loved it. I mean, this yes. was a time when women were flashing their breasts, obviously uh, willingly. Um uh kids were going to school with suck it. <laughs> How does this happen? But I did, you know, I defended DX in the second book, Foley is Good, by saying, all right, if the it in Suck It is what we think it is, then by the nature of that statement, then the it in Sit On It, which was used in Happy Days, has to be the same it. And I will argue that one action on the PG or G-rated Happy Days show was probably more hardcore than the act that DX was suggesting. Just putting it out there as devil's advocate. You're such a good guy. Uh, <laughs> you and Terry are scheduled to be the first match on this episode of Raw, but before the match takes place, there's a scene of uh, Jerry or Terry rather and JR uh, along with you. We're all discussing how you want to fight funk for a legacy of yourself. Yeah. And it's called the King of Hardcore Contest. And if you're watching over on uh, YouTube, totally on YouTube.com, you see that this was done before the doors open in the stands. This is great stuff, man. I just like the look of this. Yeah. Hey, if I could take a second, uh, you see momentarily you said Jerry there. And, um, you know, as we're recording this, we're just um, one day removed from uh, when I found out about Jerry Lawler's stroke. It may have taken place two days ago. Um, so I put a couple things out there on social media talking about, you know, clearly we all want Jerry to get a full comeback, but also uh, just noting just, I don't think people realize just how great he was, um, especially to be a top guy for decades in doing weekly towns. That's, uh, we'll never have that type of, there he is, there's the king. We'll never see that type of run again. And by the time, like the the world in general got to know Jerry, he had a lot of wear and tear on his body. But he was one of the premier bump guys, uh, not only for his time but in the history of the business, and had a knack for making uh, a lot of younger, upcoming, and sometimes not very talented. Uh, that, you know, younger and upcoming is a lot different than not talented. But I saw him drag a couple of pretty good matches out of some, you know, really non-working guys. And and over and over, he, he would have good to great matches with guys who'd never had those type of matches before. So, you know, a big salute to the king and a big prayer for a total uh, recovery. So I'm glad you made that slip so we could uh, talk about uh, the king just a little bit. Absolutely, man. Thoughts and prayers with him and his whole family. I know he's got a long road ahead of him, but, uh, man, the King's going to kick out like he always does. Yeah, he will. He will. 
Uh, the whole idea here of you sitting in the stands with Jr. and Terry is uh, you're setting up uh, a way for you both to wind up in this damn dumpster, I suppose. Right. Yeah, has it's like, say. you know, we're, we're these teammates and we love teaming up, but we love wrestling each other. And, you know, the extreme nature of what we do is just part of, part of who we are. Like, real life, I mean, legitimately, the, some of the stuff that Terry and I did to each other in Japan would have gotten us arrested in most countries in the world. Like, you can do some severe prison sentences for what <laughs> he and I did to each other. Maybe not severe, but, you know, uh, lengthy. Uh, you'd spend a, a few weeks at least or a month in jail for what Terry and I did to each other in Japan. And I just, I, I liked that way of telling that story. And you are correct. In the long run, it was a way for us both to get into that dumpster. Um, but I, I really liked the, the storytelling aspect uh, of the closeness. And we did it pretty rapidly so that uh, when that friendship and our very lives were put in peril, people cared because they knew how much we meant to each other. Are you ready for the biggest Sunday in sports? DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of Super Bowl 57, has all the Super Bowl action you need. New customers can bet just $5 and get 200 in bonus bets instantly. Plus, all customers get in on the Super Bowl 57 excitement with DraftKings Happy Hour Super Boost. Check the DraftKings Sportsbook app every day between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. Eastern to see what prop bet will be boosted. Seriously, if you're like me and you're pulling for the Eagles this weekend and they came out as a one and a half point favorite, you want to be on that. And if you've seen all the silliness you can bet on, all the crazy prop bets, did you know you can bet on the coin toss? Literally everything. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code FOLLY. New customers can bet $5 on Super Bowl 57 and get 200 in bonus bets instantly only in DraftKings Sportsbook with code FOLLY. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. So what are you waiting for? Download the DraftKings app right now and use that promo code FOLLY. Funk said in this promo, he wanted to go out as the king of the hardcores. And he said his time is limited, but it may end when he fights Cactus later tonight. And in your book, you wrote, I had a match with Terry just for the hell of it, which culminated in my flying elbow onto the fallen Funker from the side of the Titan Tron into a dumpster. With both of us incapacitated, the outlaws shut the lid and wheeled us off the ramp leading to a crash landing on the cold, hard concrete below. It should have, could have, and would have been a truly great image, but the details were all wrong. Talk to me about this. Well, I don't know what we're going to cover, um, what else I wrote, but I was just thinking about this match uh, a few days ago without realizing we'd be talking about it. And I'm not a climber, Conrad. <laughs> Not your strong suit. It's not my strong suit. And, uh, I'll just say it's not a bragging thing, but I will compare the extra <laughs> X-rays of my pelvic girdle to anybody else's, and mine will mine will be the wor among the worst pelvic girdles you've ever seen because of my decision to drop those elbows uh, off the ring apron. So there are are cracks and fissures and it, I mean, it looks like a breakaway islands, uh, you know, off the coast of Sicily. It really a disaster when it comes deep down. Uh, it's the two bones, I believe are called the pubis and the ischium. So they're not even cool sounding bones, but mine took a lot of wear and tear. And so something like climbing was real is really difficult. Even back then was really difficult. But even that medical excuse <laughs> It doesn't cover for how slow and deliberate my climbing was. Like, it was awful. It was just awful. And then dropping the elbow into a dumpster that seemed to be filled to the brim with packing peanuts, it didn't look very de devastating. <laughs> like, we could have relied on 
some cardboard boxes in there, you know, uh, you know, look at that. That's a lot of packing peanuts in there, brother. And another, I'm a stickler for details. And as you know, Connor, I'm pretty tough on my own stuff. What I should have done, what I should have insisted that instead of Terry and I staying down for the count, I think it would have been good if I came up with guns blazing, bang, bang, and then taking a, a nice, not that I'd advocate a, a chair shot to the head now, but in keeping with the times, a chair shot to the head or maybe boom, boom, nailing both me and Terry would have given us a reason to be selling something um, that otherwise did not look devastating enough to have us both down for a period of minutes. And then begins the slow roll. I don't, I don't want to jump ahead of you here. Uh, but I get you want me to just roll with it, Conrad? Yeah, go ahead. Roll with it, baby. As we're beginning the roll, uh, Terry and I are literally telling each other, I love you, Cactus. I love you too, Terry. God bless you. Vince McMahon had to be talked out of taking the dumpster bumper being the day. He, he wanted to do it himself? He wanted to do it himself. And I was like, Vince, like, you own and run this company. We don't know what's going to happen. What happens if you're badly hurt? I would never want any of you to do something I wouldn't be willing to. And then I pulled him over to the side. I was like, Vince, it's my gimmick, right? Like, you're going to kill my gimmick if you're taking the same bumps. I Okay, I understand. So... Uh, he did not take the bump, a dog on it in the same way that he took the bump over. Like, uh, he took some bump that Gronk was a little concerned yep. about taking and he just boom, went and did it. And now if you're Gronk, it's like, I just saw a guy in his sixties do that. Or he, you know, he may have been in his early seventies at that time. And so Gronk went ahead and did it, but I, I did you know, this was Vince wanting to do it. Uh, I'm glad he didn't. And plus if we'd seen how bad it, I, I didn't look bad bad but it just didn't look good enough to merit the attention it received you know where the show was essentially shot set um shut down almost and there were people crying as if they'd seen the last of us and i it was a really look at sunny did a great job of conveying her concern and it just would have been better suited for something that looked more devastating Talk to me about the bump itself. You know, I know there's lots of uh, help in there, but it's still a dumpster. It's a metal it's dumpster. It's still a dumpster. It's still something that hasn't been done before. We still don't know how it's going to turn out. And when it hit and we landed and they uh, there was like a rope for us to hold on to so we wouldn't just be th thrown about inside of it, um, our initial reaction was that didn't hurt enough to look good. I, mean, I know this is a terrible way of looking at it, but I was not like a master illusionist. You know, usually if something hurt, looked like it hurts because it did. Right. And I said, ah, you know, I realize this is like a, not a career making angle, but a big angle. It's my WrestleMania angle. And I just did not feel like it looked good enough to, uh, it didn't hurt enough to look good. And I think the visual evidence uh, bears me out on that. Well, it's, uh, it's obviously a big angle. I mean, we know that you wish it would have looked a little better, but the way the announcers laid out and yeah. the way Sonny comes out and starts crying, it felt special. It felt big. It felt real. And Meltzer would even really put over Jim Ross as doing an incredible job of selling it, that this was something that wasn't scripted to happen and something very serious. And he would even say, Sonny was shown crying like crazy to the point of being hysterical. They took him out in an ambulance, both stretched out of the dumpster in neck braces, motionless. Ross used inside technology, like going into business for yourself. And he talked about the outlaws getting a push and using their TV time to get over. And at one point, flash funk goes to attack the outlaws and a, a brawl took place. And Kevin Kelly said, those two men have children. As the ambulance pulls away, it's a hard sell. The execution with possible exception of you didn't like the way the dumpster fell. The rest of the crew, man, everybody's more than carrying their weight here. Yeah, they really are. And Sunny was, uh, she was really, really good. 
probably deserving of some more talk on another time. You know, it's, I mean, it's a tragic cautionary tale, but um, man, she was she was some kind of talent. And that was uh, really appreciated the cell job she did on our behalf. Yeah, it was really it was really well done. Even Vince coming out and talking to the outlaws. Uh, we had that up on the screen. There were a lot of things to, that pointed to it being real. Uh, and he called you Mick Foley too, and, and, you know. So we're no longer saying Chainsaw Charlie or yeah, Cassius that's Jackson. right. Yeah, he's saying Mick Foley and Terry Funk you know. and Mick Foley. Yeah, I think it was. I mean, I think it was effective because it did lead. It did lead to a match at Mania that had some pretty good interest in it. Uh, I mean, considering that Terry and I were basically like moving sprigs of parsley in the ring, <laughs> we were like. <laughs> two of the three beans in a three bean salad that Not nobody good. wanted considering those things we did have a lot of interest i mean i was i was not happy at all with the decision to have us come back in comical fashion like still <laughs> hooked up to the iv drip yep. there we go <laughs> terry's butt was hanging out i mean look at terry looks great like I, I i've got my cactus stuff on but uh man he looks great he's in the gown i don't even think he had underwear on because he was you know <laughs> it was detail oriented like me and if you were escaping from a hospital to seek vengeance uh you wouldn't have time to put your underwear on um hey look I was really grateful for the opportunity of, I mean, uh, you know, a big match at Mania, but I'm also, I was also very, very much a perfectionist and I just, man, it wasn't, there's nothing wrong with a, like a clean single or even a double off the wall. But every time you get up, especially going to the Mania, you're looking to hit a home run. And I just didn't think we hit one that night. Well, you know, listen, the decision to come back at the end of the night is certainly going to be debated forever. I think with the benefit of hindsight, we can all say probably should have waited. Yeah, we should have waited. We saw Michael Cole even on location at the hospital trying to get words on the update. And then, of course, as you mentioned, you make the big over the top silly return and <laughs> maybe it's a little less than. Wade Keller had this to say the next time the WWF wants fans to believe something is real and not part of the storyline, wish them luck. They went to great lengths to make it seem as if the dumpster tossing was unplanned. Having McMahon scald the outlaws like a boss would scold the out of line employees was a nice touch. Having the outlaws break character and try to explain themselves to McMahon came across as genuine. Having heels and baby faces all looking outraged added to the realism. Having Flash Funk, a buddy of Cactus and Funk's from their ECW days, act outraged was meant to be a clue to insiders. There were elements that didn't ring so genuine. Sonny's tearful crying continued her streak of oblivious overacting. It's admirable she could produce tears on command like she did, but tears don't necessarily equal convincing acting. Ross's incessant dropping of insider terms grew old fast. When Ross says this wasn't planned, is he admitting everything else is having Michaels and Hunter say management encourages them to push the envelope every week for ratings. Doesn't that diminish their image as anti-authority rebels? All right. So Wade is clearly taking everything very seriously here, but I could see his point on some of that. What say you? Yeah. Well, I was the one who pushed to have a little more Keller on the show, a little more perspective. And you can see how two people uh, in Dave and Wade saw this exact same thing differently. And, and I thought um, um, Sonny was really good. I did not think that was overblown. Um, but I think Wade's main point is on the money where he says the next time uh, WWE wants the audience to believe something is real good luck because, oh, man, you don't get that opportunity too often and we were given it and it just why it just wasn't convincing enough to me uh the merit that you know once in a great while type of angle and then the the ending you know emphasized that the next night in evansville indiana it's a tape draw the new age outlaws come out and reminisce about what they did the week before to cactus and charlie and 
They bring out another dumpster and road dog calls it a cactus Jack condominium. <laughs> and they replayed the incident on the Titan Tron as road dog is doing mock commentary. And then mock cries afterwards and <laughs> shoved the dumpster off the stage and then pulled the chainsaw and cactus dummies out of it. <laughs> it performs CPR. And of course, Ross is saying that cactus and chainsaw Charlie are going to get revenge on Sunday. <laughs> Listen, if we had it to do over again, this is where you guys would make the comeback, right? <laughs> yeah, we would have waited a week. I'm just wondering, can we put those cactus track dolls up for sale? Because yeah, we gotta find one of those. That seems awesome. You know what's funny is like that was kind of the the outlaws go to thing. I remember they did the same thing with Dean Smith, beloved North Carolina <laughs> basketball coach. So, I mean, I got a kick. Uh, yeah, I got a, I got a kick out of that. But you are correct. Um, the comeback would have been far more meaningful if we had done it at that point in time. Well, we know that uh, we're right around the corner from No Way Out in Houston, Texas. It's an eight man. You're in the main event here with your childhood hero, and uh, I guess the steak. Uh, it's you, <laughs> Owen Hart. Terry and Steve Austin. Yeah. Taking on DX and the Outlaws. Of course, DX here is Shawn Michaels and Hunter Hearst Helmsley. We know for certain that uh, Owen is looking for revenge after what happened to his brother. And, and he started something in December. And it feels like, hey, we're still building that direction for him and right. Shawn. Doesn't happen. Uh, we also know that Stone Cold won the Royal Rumble. He's on a collision course with Shawn Michaels. Yeah. And then here, there's you and uh, Terry Funk. You're out here looking for blood from the outlaws after what they did with the dumpster. Um, but you find out along the way, Hey man, Sean can't make it. He might have one match left in him at most. And if he's only got one left in him, we got to save that for WrestleMania. And this why is this Savio Vega took his place. That's right. So they tease the entire show that Sean is not going to be here that it's going to be a special surprise. It's a mystery guest. It's a mystery opponent. It's a mystery tag team partner. And the crowd is just white hot for Steve Austin that night. But then when the mystery partner is Savio Vega, it's not quite the same reaction. Bruce Pritchard has told us oftentimes the old booking rule of thumb is if for whatever reason you have a cancellation, you can't deliver on something that was advertised, the replacement must be greater than what it was originally. It's going to be really hard to find a bigger star here than Shawn Michaels. It sure is. A now, I, I've been at the Garden Live when I would hear Howard Finkel say something like, unfortunately, Andre the Giant could not be here as scheduled. His replacement will be hillbilly jim and he had that inflection that would make a good part of that crowd feel like they were getting something even better than andre at least momentarily right and i don't know if we had that on that evening savio you know has been a, a, a great worker and a and yes a, and a big draw in a variety of places but it had been a while since he'd really been pushed as a top guy unless i'm mistaken uh i mean i remember he was he had one of the initial feuds with stone cold steve yes. austin uh and they had a really good bull rope match that i was underneath the ring for which was not unusual because i spent like <laughs> 10 of my first 11 days with the company under the ring and you can ask bruce about that um but yeah that way it was a letdown to not have sean and have a replacement who wasn't quite of that stature and uh, this is one of those things where, you know, you have so many matches, you tend to remember, at least I do, I can recite every single thing that happened in matches that were either really good or really bad. And this kind of falls somewhere in the middle where you just, I, I just you don't recollect that much about it. Um, I know that uh, Savio introduced the barbed wire there. There was a little bit of a melee. I think it was a pretty good match, but, um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess, you know, in the at the end of the day, you do add it to your list of pay-per-view main events. But, um, I, yeah, I was, I was a little bit of a disappointment. Before we get to uh, the actual pay-per-view itself, 
this this build on the go home show if you will of monday night raw we see terry funk cut a hole in the ring from underneath with the chainsaw and uh you guys come out from underneath owen comes running out as well this is pretty cool man this is something that we didn't see a lot of at the time guys <laughs> coming through the ring are you there the whole freaking day like you were those first 11 Ooh, days and yeah i don't know if they yet introduced me to the quicker way of doing it i think i was even though i'd been in the company for a couple of years i i think i was still being ribbed by spending the whole day underneath the ring <laughs> come my goodness as opposed to being whisked there under the cover of darkness and create some type of uh you know distraction distraction yeah and that's you know i think uh you, you and bruce would probably talk about this i see it happening one day years you know years later when i'm back as commissioner or something or maybe just get a guest and i said bruce did you have the uh, ability to whisk me under the ring 10 minutes before i was due out he goes, of course we did. I said, and you opted not to do that? Said, of course we did. <laughs> so I said, this was a rib on me? Yeah, of, of course it was. So I spent a lot of time under that ring because <laughs> no one had ever given me the information that they had the technology to whisk me under there 10 minutes before I was needed. Amazing. Uh, that's uh, that's going to be the highlight of this whole episode, at least for me. <laughs> Uh, but it's a hell of a brawl to, uh, to end the show and coming up through the ring, this has to be a highlight. I mean, not only are you getting to do something fun and, and out of the ordinary like this, but you're getting to do it with your wrestling hero. It's yeah. pretty awesome. How cool is that? Super. Yeah. Cool. So we probably had great conversations for five or six hours underneath that ring. Uh, it's a hell of a brawl to end the show. And, and of course we know now we're on our way to the pay-per-view, but before we get there, Boy wrestling loses somebody uh, pretty special. Louis Piccoli passes away so young. He had been here in the WWF as Rad Radford at the time. He was working for WCW and uh, sort of being Scott Hall's flunky, I guess you might say. But he had just come off a run in ECW too. And a young man in his 20s. What do you remember, if anything? Did you ever work or spend any time with Louis Piccoli? Well, you know, Louis was one of the, he was, I don't know if he was in extra or if he was getting a little push with herb abrams at uwf uh so when they started running at that ah oh man something like the Reseda country club something along, or maybe i'm thinking about uh karate kid but i believe it had country club attached to it uh yeah louis was a guy i spent quite a bit of time with um hanging out with uh even on the off days i liked louis and I was glad when he was getting success in Japan and picked up by uh, WWE. And at the time that I knew him and spent time, I, I didn't know he had uh, he had an issue, right? Substance issue. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but was that the that was the cause of death? Yes, right? yes, it was. You know, someone doesn't just die of natural causes in their early 20s. So that was a real shame. I don't know where he ran into that, you know, atmosphere and. Uh, uh, I think in Mexico, drugs are much easier to procure. I don't even think you need prescriptions in some pharmacies. Um, and it's easy to get tired. It's easy to fall down that hole. It really is. Um, we're in a business where, you know, pain is the, you know, is the norm. And I was lucky, you know, that I had a perspective going into wrestling where I knew what I wanted to do. I knew it was going to hurt. I knew the drugs were, um, you know, a major obstacle and I, and I, and I just vowed not to get caught up in it, but Louis didn't get out. He didn't get out. So he was a real talented guy gone way too soon. Another fellow, since we're just sending all of our condolences today, who's gone way too soon. Lanny Poffo has passed away since you and I last recorded. Did you get to spend any time with Lanny over the years? I did. Um, I had a good talk with Lanny about, oh man, I know I'm saying four years ago. That was the last time I talked to him at length. And he was telling me, it's just, it's great to hear these stories. Uh, I, it may have been Pampiro Furpo, who was the guy that Randy heard saying, ooh, yeah, in a different type of way. But Lanny was telling me his brother, he wouldn't think it now at all. 
he was getting the in-ring part. He was having trouble with his character. And he watched a couple guys like we all do. We take stuff that works and we twist it and make it our own. And, uh, and I always loved hearing those perspectives. What I was really fascinated by was when, um, you know, when I was in my world class days and uh, one of the guys said that I was <laughs> the most frugal wrestler they'd ever seen. And then, uh, oh, what's his name? Frank Dusick goes out, oh, brother. He goes, <laughs> he took offense. He goes, don't get me wrong, Jack, you are cheap, but you are not even in the Paphos League. Uh, and so it was the Paphos and Rip Rogers that I looked up to as the great money savers. And I think when I first mentioned it to Lanny, he thought I was taking a knock at him when I was really praising him because that was the category that I wanted to be in. You know, uh, Angelo had that territory in Tennessee, Kentucky, parts of Arkansas, and they didn't have the, the TV behind them like uh, Lawler's uh, company did. They had to save money. They had to work harder. You know, the legendary stuff that I heard of Lanny and Randy doing in these small venues, you know, um, were things that I really connected with. I wanted to be that type of guy. And so we got to see a different type of Lanny Poffo in WWE and in WCW, and it was enjoyable. But I wish I could go back and see uh, the Lanny uh, who was cutting his teeth in Angelo's uh, promotion. ICW, man. I, I wonder if any of that footage still exists somewhere. I need to go look for something. I don't know. We, uh, we got to talk about the show here. No Way Out. 1998 we're in houston texas when do you find out sean won't be able to be in the match do you know when you by the time you get to the building or do you find out there man i, I wish i knew conrad i wish i should just lie and say give you a time of day but i didn't know i honestly i didn't know he was even supposed to be in it until you told me that um yeah i wish i could be a little more helpful here i think we're dying on the vine on this episode no, I don't think so at all. Listen, we got that whole story uh, about being ribbed and st spending half your life underneath the ring. How are we going to miss with that? Uh, in hindsight, you know, we know it's going to be Savio Vega, and clearly he had a history with uh, Stone Cold, including matches on pay per view. Uh, but would somebody else have worked, in your opinion, to team with with you guys? Oh, man, man. Well, Savio was against us, right? Right, 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 right. I'm uh, saying. Like The Rock could have worked, maybe. He's on the other side. Or Goldust or Mark uh, Marrow. Well, The Rock was all... We already knew that great things were going to be happening for The Rock. Uh, I get You know, Marrow could have fed to Goldust. I can't remember where they were. I, well, you know, uh, Mark Marrow had a heck of a, a match, a uh, um, uh, mixed tag match at, at WrestleMania. So he was already in his own angle. Um, yeah, The Rock was doing the thing with Ken Shamrock too. I mean, yeah, so there's yeah, yeah, and I think Goldust and it was Goldust and Mark Marrow who ended up doing the angle with Luna and Sable. Yeah, and they had a really good match. So it's it's easy to knock Mark, and I certainly did it over the years, uh, really just because I was envious of his contract. Um, but the stuff he did was working, not not like Johnny B. Bad at work because that was just something Dusty saw in him and brought it to life and it was the perfect fit for Mark. And he put a lot of work into making it as effective as possible. And I don't think the the wild man ever caught on like uh, uh, Johnny B. Bad did, but it's not to say that it wasn't successful. I mean, he was an IC champion, had a great uh, mania match uh, with uh, Luna, Sable and Goldust. So those two guys would have been kind of married to each other. Uh, I guess Savio was thought to be the best uh, choice. And Savio was a guy who, uh, you know, he'd worked uh, Puerto Rico, he'd worked Japan, he'd had a nice run in WWE. Like he was a real solid, proven worker. And when he when he uh, broke out the barbed wire, like it got a heck of a reaction. Steve cut a little promo on me afterwards, you know, because, uh, you know, really you should not have barbed wire in a straight up, uh, you know, uh, tag encounter. Uh, so there's definitely a point to that. 
Um, but I think we were just trying to throw anything. To, I think I was aware that it didn't look on paper to be a great main event, like an eight man or a 10 man seldom is. I think uh, the exception that proves the rule is that amazing match at Calgary Stampede. But generally you don't see eight and 10 man tag teams at the top of the cards on uh, PPVs. No, it's exactly right. You do not see it. And it's even said that the decision to make this a no non-sanctioned, no DQ match was made the day of because Sean couldn't be there. And I think the match is better for it. I mean, I remember being really entertained with some of the blows you guys were throwing and some of the weapons you were using. There's a, a couple of shots with trash cans and it does chairs. Look it's just crazy. It does look good, doesn't it? I mean, as a fan, I really enjoyed the match, but I do remember being let down simply because they had built this entire almost show long thread, just one after another talking about this mystery opponent. And then when we finally get the mystery opponent, again, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but it's quote unquote, just Savio Vega. I mean, they had it hyped as if this is Kevin Nash coming back or something like that. And right. it's Savio Vega. And again, it was a fine match. I enjoyed the match, but I do think managing expectations is kind of the key to life. And maybe mine were mismanaged there. Yeah. I'll have to go back and look at it. it. Certainly looks like it was a good match. And I think it was reviewed pretty well from what I recall. I don't know if I was reading any of the newsletters at that time because I thought it was counterproductive, but I do think it was uh, pretty well uh, received. Meltzer would call it a basic FMW slash ECW style match as a reminder. And you saw it in the still photos there. Road Dog's going to power bomb Terry Funk through two chairs. Right. And Gunn's going to pile drive him on a garbage can lid. I mean, we're throwing out lots of weapons here. Lots of craziness here. But and keep in mind, Dave has seen a lot of ECW and FMW yes. style matches like this. Most WWE fans had not. Yeah, And so it was unusual. I'd be lying if I said, oh, they were going crazy because I, I can't remember that much about it. But I would think that it would have been um, well received because it was unusual in WWE. Remember, this is a company that just a few years earlier had to have uh, Jerry Lawler come out and apologize for hitting Duke the Dog Dumpster Drossy with a garbage can. Yes. And like that was like outlandish. Um, and, you know, I think it's pretty well documented that part of the reason Vince and Mr. McMahon did not want me in WWE is he thought some of the things I did and my style kind of debased the product. Um, so we're talking at, about a company that was, you know, maybe G rated. If you're having to publicly apologize, not an angle, but public, publicly apologize for using an aluminum uh, trash can on Duke uh, Drozzi, then, uh, you know, the bar is pretty low as far as, you know, the procession of the gimmicks, as I like to call it, where you hope that each gimmick that's introduced outdoes the one before it. And I think, uh, I mean, again, uh, I think we're dying on the vine and this is the worst podcast we've ever done. <laughs> Well, let me tell you, you guys pulled the nose up on this match. I thought the match had good violence. I enjoyed it. It goes 17 minutes and 41 seconds. <laughs> Meltzer liked it enough, I guess. He gave it three and a half stars. But the real story is what happens after the match. What happened? China's going to get in the ring, shove him twice, flip Steve off. Finally, he kicks her, gives her the stunner, and the crowd goes bananas. This is the first time we've seen anyone use physicality towards China it's not on TV. It's on pay-per-view. And we had seen her get the better of the guys, yourself yeah. included, over and over and over. But when she finally catches a stunner, much like Sergeant Slaughter and Vince McMahon and everyone else, man, the place just loses their freaking mind. What a moment. <laughs> just I'm looking at this photo of the two of them nose to nose. And it's just a reminder of how badass Joni was. Yes. Uh, and she had that type of heat. You know, I, I, because going back in time, I know we did, dedicated an entire episode to the match uh, at Madison Square Garden where dude, uh, <laughs> where the three faces of Foley were seen on the, sorry about that, the Titan Tron at the Garden. And, uh, and then uh, Cactus came out and we had a heck of a brawl. 
But in order to have any physicality at all with Joni, it had to look like it was directed by her so or by Hunter. So in the case of uh, even with me, uh, Hunter reversed a whip and jo Joni was in my way and she power slammed me onto the stairs. So that was to excuse even looking like we might be hurting Joni. So you're right. This was the first time. And then it was like once the gloves were off. Wow. WWE went all out with uh, that type of thing. Uh, and I don't know how I felt about all of it, but hey, there was no denying that monster pop that night and that she had a lot of heat built up, you know, with uh, with uh, with the X. And it was an incredible reaction. At this point, you know, you're going to be in a dumpster match with Funk, right? Or are you still maintaining hope that there's still a chance? I don't know. I don't. Uh, as long as this is the worst podcast we've ever done, I might as well just say, I don't know to everything you say to me, just, I'm going to be the worst, worst guest on his own podcast there's ever been. I'm going to be like the anti Bret Hart of podcasts. I'm going to be the worst there is, <laughs> the worst there was, the worst there ever will be. And so just keep in mind, my answer to everything is, I don't know, Conrad. So just business as usual for 83 weeks listeners. Uh, well no listen I, here's the thing uh eric much like yourself says he refuses to lie so if he doesn't know he'll just say i don't know yeah Whereas bruce pritchard will say well let me tell you another story and just go hard left real fast that's not bad they call that the pivot yes uh, he's pivoting well these days so maybe i shall pivot the next time he loves it you'll love yours too hansonshaving.com forward slash foley well, I don't think this will be required here. We got a lot of questions about, uh, this episode, Instagram, a wrestling historian wants to know how awkward was it to see Steve Austin work with Owen Hart after the neck injury incident? We never really talked about that. I know that they weren't best of friends. I know Steve still had hard, hard feelings about it. Now he's about to get his big moment though. And Owen's back and they're on the same side of things here. As far as you could tell, they were cordial enough to do business, or could you tell this is pretty cold? Um, it seemed it seemed okay. It seemed it seemed okay to me. It never stood out in my mind as if it was uh, uncomfortable. But I wasn't Owen, and I wasn't Steve, so I, I don't know. Jason Bayless has a great question. I watched this on replay over and over and over. How underrated of a spot was Austin throwing the trash can at Billy Gunn? This is, I don't know if you recall this spot, Mick, but he just throws the trash can at him full speed. And I know it's an aluminum trash can and it's not the most dangerous thing in the world, but the visual and, and they hadn't been overexposed with the trash cans at that point. Yeah. I thought it was fantastic. Do you remember that spot? I don't, but you know, uh, Casey Hopkins who's uh, my invaluable assistant, right. On social media and uh, has met with you a couple times, right? Yeah. He was uh, kind of just introduced to Antonio Inoki after Inoki passed away. And he was like, wow, like he was really taken by the fact that it wasn't, Inoki didn't do that much, but that everything he did, he put everything he had into everything he did. And so I think there's some of that in, the, in Stone Cold as well, is that Steve didn't have the repertoire that a lot, especially the guys today, you know, Steve, he had a good move set, but not the largest move set. But Steve was like that. He put everything he had into everything he did. So if Steve was gonna, um, if Steve was going to throw a punch, believe me, uh, fielding those Austin punches <laughs> was no day at the beach. And if he was going to throw a trash can, he was going to throw it as hard as he possibly could. So although I don't remember it, I'm just thinking, you know. Man, that yeah, yeah, uh, that's the type of thing would get an enormous pop because no one would have seen something sailing at that type of speed. Guys had hit each other with garbage cans before, but uh, Steve going all out, doing it one hundred percent, and it being Steve Austin doing it would make a huge difference. Scott Golden wants to know what was the craziest risk you ever saw Terry Funk take. It wasn't so much one risky move. To me, Terry's legacy is that 
he had the very best match he could every single night he was out there. I've said before, maybe it was in uh, the forward I wrote to Terry's book, that Terry and Ric Flair were the only people I ever felt were 100% on every time I saw them. Like, I wished I could get into the zone like those two guys did, which seemed to be every time they got in the ring. And so, you know, Terry, you know, he's in a t tough way physically. And I don't think it's because of one risk. I think it's because of thousands of impactful moments. So it wasn't so much the risk. I mean, he was 20 years older than I was. Well, he, was he still is 20 years older than I am, but 20 years uh, older than I was when we did the, the deathmatch stuff. And he was the guy not only taking the bumps, but suggesting they put more C4 in them, you know? And I said to him, I said, Terry, he goes, oh, that looks good. I think we just need one more explosive right in the middle. And I said, if there are explosives on both sides and in the middle, where are we going to land? And he said, oh, don't worry, it'll, it'll be fine. And I made the mistake of listening to him. It wasn't fine at all. <laughs> <laughs> the least little bit. Um, but, and there's a move that, was it risky or was it highly impactful? So that, you know, I'm one of those guys, you know, I know I'm making this about me instead of about Terry, but, you know, a lot of the wrestlers have that telltale scar, you know, where they've had the neck surgery. And as wild as the stuff I did, I avoided things like that. I was largely in control of my own destiny. And I think Terry was that same way where it wasn't the risk taking, it was the willingness to put it all out there and be impactful every single night, if that makes sense. Well said. Uh, I love uh, just hearing you talk about Terry Funk. Mike has a question. Foley, did you pack your dude, mankind, and cactus gear every night at this time? <laughs> Probably so. Yeah, and I still do. So uh, let me see. I've got, uh, I got the mankind right here. Hold on a second. Uh-oh. Have a nice day. So there's mankind. And then uh, if you want me to really do it up, as we say, I mean, that's a multi-part thing. My peace sign glasses just broke yesterday. But, oh, no. Uh, I filled in with some regular ones and say. <laughs> Dude has a tale to tell you about. But a man who tried his best, although it's true, he failed at WrestleMania. No one came through when it mattered less. So, yes. So, yeah, I still travel with that stuff. So, I think if I'm still traveling with all three characters in 2023, yeah, I would have had all that stuff in my bag in, uh, in 98. Uh, Bobby has a great question responding to something we've talked about before. Was there ever anything discussed for your match with funk that Vince was against? When we say the match with funk that night, uh, well, the hypothetical match that you were going to have at WrestleMania on the ranch and do all this crazy I violence. What, I think what it was, was Vince realized that the uh, Tyson, I mean, I may have even written about this, my recollection at this point is that once the Tyson thing hit really hard, and I mean that in the most positive way possible, that Vince realized there were going to be a lot of new eyeballs on the product, you know, mainstream news media. And my recollection is that a match of that nature might be a turnoff. I'll give you an example. Um, after and this is a completely different type of match um but on the night it was the summer slam where edge and christian faced uh, the hardys i don't know if the dudleys were in that one or not we might have a have grillo find out if that was summer slam or not um i believe uh terry runnels was involved in like a bathing suit match of some kind and I read a review like a mainstream review and they were focused much more on what they perceived as the negativity of that type of match. Whereas all of us in the back were just, we were just so amazed by what the other people had done uh, in that, you know, landmark match. 
and I don't think Vince wanted to give anyone the chance to turn on the product. Like I said, having Terry and I in some type of exploding death match uh, from the, the Double Cross Ranch would not in any way resemble a bikini match between the two women, but I, the idea that it would take much deserved attention away from this amazing main event, I think uh, is I, there's something to that. Uh, here's another uh, with uh, George Jones. He says, if they had chosen someone other than Savio Vega as the partner, who would you like to have seen them use? Of course, let's pretend that we're not dealing with the current roster. We're saying all time. Is there somebody else that could have worked? Like, could it have been China? Could it have been Sean Waltman? Is there someone else Ooh, on the other yeah. side? Yeah, those are two excellent choices, man. China had not started wrestling the guys yet, right? Right, right. That would have been an excellent choice. The Man, no wonder you were the pod father, Conrad. Oh, goodness gracious. Well, listen, next week, I hope it's another wonderful choice. Super Brawl 3. It's the beginning of your babyface run in WCW in 1993. You're working with Paul Orndorff. And this is the first pay-per-view of the Eric Bischoff era. Uh, in the meantime, you can enjoy plenty of other bonus content over at adfreeshows.com. You hear us talk about Gary Juster a lot here on our programs, but you probably have never heard from Gary before until now. We sat down with Gary and talked to him about his time in the AWA and the NWA and WCW and Ring of Honor and even MLW, and it's available now over at adfreeshows.com. We also have a brand new episode of the book which is where we revisit memory lane, talking about some of the great moments in Jim Crockett promotions history. We're doing it show by show day by day through all of 1985. January is posted. Now February is coming up before you know it. It's where we sit down on camera with David and break down his brother's books. This is from his no longer with us now deceased Jim Crockett Jr.'s personal collection from the handwriting of JJ Dillon from the genius mind of dusty Rhodes. This is as inside the business as you can get a promoter's red book. And we do it page by page over at adfreeshows.com. By the way, if your business targets men 25 to 54 years old, there's no better place to advertise than right here with us on Folius pod. You've heard us do ads for some of the same companies over and over and over. Why is that? Well, because it really works or well, a super targeted audience. There's very little waste. Go to advertise with Foley.com now and find out about how easy it is to advertise here on Foley's pod. In the meantime, he is on Facebook at Real Mick Foley, also on Instagram at Real Mick Foley. I am Hey Hey, It's Conrad, and I'm also on Twitter at Hey Hey, It's Conrad. You can also interact with the show at Foley's pod. That'll work everywhere, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. But the easiest and cheapest way to subscribe to the show and support the show is YouTube. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and turn your notifications bell on at Foley on YouTube.com. And don't forget, we've got a bunch of new swag over, all kinds of merch at FoleyIsPodShirts.com. You see the Dude It Up shirt, the Hardcore Legend, the Commissioner shirt, the Mr. In Your House shirt, the Hardcore Legend fanny pack, which is available with extenders. Lots of fun stuff for you over at Foley. I'm guessing. Is it safe to say the Phantom Balls shirt is sold out completely? Uh, we are getting it restocked by the time this airs, the phantom ball shirt will be back up at Folius pod shirts, but we had a run on the bank, man. They sold out right away. Do we have to split that with Shawn Michaels? Yeah, I feel like we probably should. <laughs> or you know what? Here's what we'll do. We'll send his check to Savio Vega. There you go. Thanks. Hey, um, lesson to be learned. Um, <laughs> what was what was the name of this pay-per-view? No Way Out, 1998. No Way Out, and I thought it was going to be the uh, Over the Edge. Over the Edge, 98. Yeah. yeah. So, again, the complete lack of preparation I did for um, <laughs> Over the Edge did not infringe upon the lack of preparation I did for this show. Uh, thanks for covering for me, Conrad. I will be back in studio uh, next week, we're going to begin the Foley Weight Loss Challenge. And just to put in people's uh, heads that uh, Foley Cameo is not a bad way to go for Valentine's Day. So uh, cameo.com slash Mick Foley. And I'll see you guys on Foley's pod next week.
Hey, shout out to, uh, the cameo, by the way, nothing better than getting a visit from dude love on oh, uh, that special day. Love. Come on. Oh, it writes itself. Yeah. I only have three Valentine's day songs, but two of them are really good. And a dude came through with <laughs> the, the worst song today where he sang <laughs> engagement. Yeah. 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 Better than in estrangement. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So that could have been the worst song I've ever sung. Uh, but, um, I got a couple good Valentine's day songs, so you can request them. Check it out. Cameo is where you can find Mick Foley. And if you're looking for a little more bonus content, find him right now over at adfreeshows.com. We're going into an ad free shows overrun. We'll see you guys next week right here on Foley's pod.